Ohaina, and welcome to Voices of Truth One on One with Hawaii's Future, brought to you by the Kiwani Foundation. I'm Ehu Kekahu Cardwell, and here we are today in Honolulu. And I'll tell you this right now, we have a fascinating guest on the show, so let's go on over here and meet him. Michael. Aloha, how are you? Hello. Michael right. Lilly, did I say your name right? You did. Wonderful. It's great to be here. Wonderful. Great to have you on Voices of Truth. Tell Thank us you. where we are right now today. Well, we're at Oahu Cemetery, uh, the Great Oahu Cemetery, and, a, and I have some family here, so we're by the family plot. Wow, you have a very interesting history, don't you, Michael? Yeah, um, our family's been here, I'm five generation, fifth generation, Kiki Oka'aina. So we've been here a while. People always ask me, how long have you been here? Forever. Wow, goes back five generations. Yes. Wow, so before we get into the past, let's start with the present. So you're presently a practicing attorney here in Honolulu. I am. And you've also been in some, involved in some pretty prominent uh, legal cases of late, uh, one of which would people know uh, called Na'iapuni. And that was when there was an attempt about a year ago to tribalize Hawaiians. Yes. Uh, and so there were some people who tried to do that, and then there was a whole bunch of other people who said, wait a minute, we're not doing that because that's wrong. And there was some legal action that took place to try and stop that, which was successful. And you were part of that effort, weren't you? Yes, Judicial Watch mm -hmm. and I brought suit to stop this race-based election of a Hawaiian tribe, is what they really wanted. The AHA was to create a Hawaiian tribe and we went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court and got an injunction stopping the election. And so we were successful in preventing uh, the creation of a tribe. And we came, they, came, they got very close to it with the Obama administration, mm -hmm. uh, but it didn't happen. So we were successful. I want to start to go back in time now. And let's talk a little bit about you served for many, many years in the U.S. Navy, didn't you? Yes. I. Uh, I spent uh, two tours in Vietnam in combat mm -hmm. uh, in the Navy, mm -hmm. and then uh, uh, 27 years uh, in the reserve retiring as a Navy captain. So, uh, you know, I spent a full career in the Navy. Wow, and I've seen your picture there standing proud in your Navy white with your <laughs> cap on and, and everything. Yeah. And now let's go back further and let's talk about your ancestors. And they're right over here, aren't they? Yes, they Can are. Can walk over here and see them? We're well, we call this the Walker Plot. Okay. Uh, and it starts with uh, basically our founder, John S. Walker, Sr., and, uh, and his wife, Jane McIntyre Walker. Um, so he came from Scotland uh, and he was leading wagon trains to Salt Lake City and he got Rocky Mountain fever. And they said, go to the tropics. And so he got here and he said this is the place so he stayed here and he was in business and he was very successful um, what year was that that he arrived here 1854 okay so that was during the Hawaiian kingdom yes oh yes wow. and he became a Hawaiian uh, citizen a Hawaiian subject of, Hawaiian national he was a he was a citizen of the monarchy he, he pledged fealty he became a citizen of the monarchy Jane Walker was born in Lahaina in 1846 uh, her parents came from Scotland as well uh, and came here via Tahiti, kind of an interesting <laughs> connection, but uh, they became Hawaiian subjects uh, in the 18th, in 1800s, mid-1800s. Um, and then John and Jane had uh, 10 children. One was my grandfather here, uh, Henry Walker Sr. When I was 18 and he was in his mid-80s, I spent a lot of time on his lanai up here at the Walker Estate, just about three blocks away, talking about his life and history. And I wish I had the questions I have today that, that are gone, but I would ask him, I, 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 first of all, tell me about what it was. He was born in the monarchy. He was born in 1885, so he was a subject of the Hawaiian kingdom. And when I, I'd say to him, what is a Hawaiian? And he said, Michael, we're Hawaiian. And, you know, in his mind, it wasn't a racial thing. It was, he Nation was, nationality. he was a national. He was a Hawaiian yeah. national. And he always said we were royalists, uh, that the overthrow was wrong. Uh, it was a travesty. 
and uh, but I, I didn't know much more than that. Uh, his brothers were older. He was he was only eight years old at the revolution, but his his older brothers all supported the queen and were all thrown in jail wow. for a day. Wow. Both both during the revolution, the 1885 rebellion, they were involved in that. But um, but he said they were all they all went to jail. What what I didn't know is what happened to his father until much later. John Walker, he was very active in politics and in, in, in the Hawaiian monarchy. He was a member of Kalakaua's Privy Council. Mm -hmm. He was his attorney general a couple of times, also his minister of finance. He was the president of the Senate. He was very active in, in the business community and also in the monarchy. He supported Kalakaua. Uh, he knew King Kamehameha V. Um, and he was a supporter and confidant of Queen Liliuokalani. And the day of the revolution, uh, the queen reports in her book that, that Mr. Walker came, this is getting a little emotional to me, but Mr. Walker came to her to express his painful duty, she says, his painful duty that the Committee of Public Safety has demanded her abdication. So he was the one that delivered the bad news. He delivered the bad news. He didn't agree with it. And she had initially said, I had no intention of doing that. But when the Marines were landed, she felt she had to for the safety of her subjects. To avoid uh, bloodshed. That's, that's the reason that she gave in the book, right. she says, to avoid any bloodshed and for the safety of her subjects that she abdicated. Right. So, Michael, was there bloodshed? I always was told that it was a bloodless uh, revolution, and I've always seen that it, it's been written up that right. way, and, and the, the uh, provisional government, I think, put that out. I've seen it in newspaper articles in the 1890s that mm -hmm. it was bloodless. Uh, when I was the chair of the Advisory Committee on Civil Rights on the Civil Rights Commission for Hawaii, uh, I went back to research more about what happened back then because we were looking at the Kaka Bill and things like that. And I found in the Queen's book, she receives Jane Walker in May of 1893 and tells her, in the Queen's word, tells her her condolences at the loss of her husband who died by the treatment he received at the hands of the revolutionaries. Wow. Now, I don't know what happened, but whatever happened caused his death. The revolutionaries, his treatment by the revolutionaries, who, by the way, these were all confidants and friends of his. So they, they knew each other. They were all in Kalakaua's cabinet. They were all in the, in the, the, uh, the legislature together. They all knew each other. So they were, they were friends. Uh, but there was such a schism and of course, he supported the monarchy. As Gramps always said, we're royalists. He said, right, the last thing I ever heard from Gramps was, I'm a royalist. What a tragedy. So he was supporting the queen and somehow, whatever, how he was treated resulted in his death. They killed him. So it was not bloodless. It was not a bloodless revolution. It was not. Wow, that's amazing. So they, it's, you know, I didn't realize that they knew each other. Oh, they were so close. There were letters between them. And remember, Hawaii was a small community in those days, very small. Mm -hmm. And the leading, and you know, Howley people that supported the, the king and the queen, the people that worked for her, that were in the legislature, they all lived the same community, they worked together, they knew each other, they knew each other in business, and they knew the, each other in government. Mm -hmm. So they were all friends. But the friendship broke in the revolution because the royalists supported the queen and did not support the revolution. And so they became enemies. So Michael, not only are you a descendant of Hawaiian Kingdom Nationals, but your family supported the Queen and was against the revolution. Yes. Wow. Absolutely. That's, uh, Gramps said that it was, it was a tragedy. It was an act against the government, against someone that you had uh, 
pledge fealty to. Mm -hmm. And you broke that pledge. Um, J.S. Walker didn't. He, he kept that pledge. Each of them died as proud Hawaiian Kingdom Nationalists supporting the Queen. Yes, they, he said, I'm a royalist. And he meant a Hawaiian monarchy royalist. This is a umeke poi ko bowl uh, that was given to J.S. Walker by King Kamehameha V. Wow. It goes that far back. So this, this is an old, old calabash bowl and you can see, for example, oh, look at that. this stitching that wow. repaired it at one time. They use little bits of wood they pound in there to repair the crack. Isn't that amazing? Mm. Ko poi bowl. So this would be about, what, 150, 200 years old? Oh, yeah. It, it's, it's probably 150 years old. And this yeah. was handed down in your family right. to you. Right. It went from... Kamehameha V. V to J.S. Walker to Gramps uh -huh. to me. Gramps had 10 King, Kamehameha, uh, King Kalakaua poi bowls. And so each of the Walker grandchildren got one Kalakaua poi bowl. And then on the bottom of this poi bowl, you see the symbol that's been burned in there. There's the, there's the, uh, the crown and the KK. And, and the second K is reversed. Wow. Right. So that's a King Kalakaua symbol. We've all seen, I guess, the black and white photographs yes. of Kalakaua eating at a table and these bowls. You see these very bowls rayed around the table in, in the front photograph. of it. Yes. Gramps was very proud that unlike some, and I'm not going to name names, but there were some people, families that became wealthy under the monarchy took advantage in some respects and, and, uh, and benefited themselves significantly. And Gramps was always proud that our family never did that. Uh, his father made money and was successful as a businessman, but he, he never profited being in the monarchy or being um, in the Privy Council. So he, he was proud of that legacy of the family. This is J.S. Walker's uh, father and mother-in-law's plot, the McIntyres. They were also Scottish. They, they emigrated from Scotland to New Zealand, met there, married there, then went to Tahiti and were in business in Tahiti and something caused them to move here. Hmm. And so they moved here in the 1840s and their daughter that married J.S. Walker was born in Lahaina in 1847. Hmm. And what I, what I love about knowing about Hugh McIntyre is that I have his citizenship paper. But wait a minute, you have his Hawaiian Kingdom citizenship paper? Now this, this is, you have to imagine, these are all 100% Scots. Right. J.S. Walker was 100% Scott. Right. His wife was Scott. The McIntyres were Scott, so 100%. No, no Hawaiian blood? Nothing. Yep. They were pure Scott. And so here's the, uh, and, and the citizenship paper that he signs is in both Hawaiian and English. And this is dated uh, January 25th, 1867. So he'd been here for 20 years or so mm -hmm. uh, when he signed this. But in, in English, it says, Governor of the Hawaiian Islands, the undersigned, a native of Tahiti, lately residing in Honolulu, being duly sworn upon the holy evangelists, upon his oath declares that he will support the constitution and laws of the Hawaiian Islands and bear true allegiance to his majesty Kamehameha V, the king. And it's signed and subscribed and it's also notarized uh, Hugh McIntyre Jr. January 25, 1867. And here he is here right he is, here. Right here. Wow. So he, he was a Hawaiian national. Wow. Wow. And he, he declared fealty to King Kamehameha V. The reason not Yapuni, the people who wanted to create a Hawaiian tribe that never was, mm -hmm. they look at the monarchy being an illegal overthrow as the basis for creating a Hawaiian tribe, but that's illegitimate. That's illegitimate for the reason that the Hawaiian monarchy was 
had no racial restrictions. It didn't. It was not a tribe. It was uh, the most egalitarian country in, in the face of the earth at the time. More egalitarian than America. They accepted all comers. There wasn't even a, a word in Hawaiian to distinguish races. You didn't distinguish a Chinese from a Haole, from a Hawaiian. Uh, if you're a citizen, you're a citizen. We were ahead of other nations. Way ahead. Way ahead. We didn't have racial laws. America had racial laws. Michael, we've come up the street about a block from where we were, Oahu Cemetery, and now we've come to the place where all the Mo'i, the royals, the rulers of the Hawaiian kingdom are buried, Mauna Ala, yeah? That's not what we call it. We call, really? it, we call this the mausoleum, the royal mausoleum. Mauna Ala was the Walker home. The, wait a minute. This is, was not called Mauna Ala back in the old days? I've always known this as the Royal Mausoleum. That's what Gramps called it. But at least in the 18, uh, from the time of the 1880s, the Walker home, which was immediately Mauka, right here, was Mauna Ala. That was the Walker home. So that was Mauna Ala. That was Mauna Ala. The next door was Mauna Ala, Sweet Mountain. Wow. Wow, because today so many people call this Mauna Ala. That's wonderful. I think they're, I'm assuming they adopted that from the Hawaiian, the Walker home. Wow. The, their name for their, their home. So there's a connection. There is a very close connection. Wow. Because think of this, Gramps grew up next door to the mausoleum. So he grew up right over there. He grew up here. And the original home is gone. It's gone but and I've got pictures of it. It was a magnificent home. It had big wide verandas, lanais going around, and it was wow. it was a beautiful place, and, and uh, unfortunately it's gone, but it, it was way before our time. Michael, I want to walk over here to this uh, tomb over here because there's a direct connection yeah. to where we're headed right now with one of the things that you showed us a few moments ago on the show, Right. and that was the poi bowl. That'll and, make a bowl uh, was given to J.S. Walker by Kamehameha V. And he is buried, buried right, right, here. right here. So that would have been in the 1860s. Wow. So his, his connection to the monarchy, you know, growing up I always thought it was Kalakaua, but it happened before Kalakaua. But he was in the Kalakaua, um, you know, the uh, Privy Council. So. Mm -hmm. um, but the connection there was very strong. So who was the first um, Mo'ia royal that he, your family served or were connected to? It had to be Kamehameha V. As a kid, Michael, did you ever come up here to the Royal Mausoleum? Yes, I did, and I haven't been back here probably in 40 years. No kidding. No, and I'm so glad that you made this possible for me uh, to come up here because I go by it all the time, and I always think of Mauna Ala, and then you show me this other connection. Right. That's that's wonderful. So what's it like for you being up here right now, having not been here in 40 years? You know, chicken skin. Yeah. You know, it's it really, you know, I just lost my cousin, Pam Burns, my first cousin. She was the head of the Humane Society. And J.S. Walker started the Humane Society. No kidding. In 1883. The Hawaii, the Hawaiian Humane Society. In 1883, he started it, and Pam has been the head of it for the last like, two decades, mm. and we just lost her. So there's, I have a lot of emotion here, and the family here, and the Walker stayed up there, and the cemetery there. So there's, there's great mana here. There's just wonderful, positive things, in the connection, but also very emotional. There's history here, yeah. there's family here, yeah. and there's a lot of emotion here. You are one of just a handful of people, I would suspect, that are alive today who can trace their heritage back to their ancestors living in the Hawaiian kingdom yeah. who were not of Hawaiian blood. Right. Yeah? Right. There's, there's a handful, um, but not many. And uh, when I tell people I'm a fifth generation Kiki Oka, I know they, they're amazed because most, most people you meet are recent additions to Yeah, Hawaii. most people think if you're Caucasian that you moved here recently to Hawaii. <laughs> That's right.
going forward, what do you think is going to happen here in terms of, of perpetuating people like you? Or are people like you literally going to die out and be no more? No, we have our children. I've got children. And, uh, I don't, what I worry about more is, is the history dying. Ah. I don't want to see that erased. When Gramps uh, was a kid, he spoke fluent Hawaiian. Really? And I asked him, I says, how was it that you spoke Hawaiian? He says, you had to. You'd go to a store, everybody spoke Hawaiian. So he, he knew Hawaiian fluently mm. as, as much as he knew English. So he was raised speaking Hawaiian. He was raised speaking Hawaiian. When the Walker children were growing up, Gramps made sure, because he was so steeped in Hawaiiana, that he made sure his three children, my mother Ginger, her brother Henry Walker, and sister Anne, were taught uh, Hawaiiana from Iolani Lahine, a great teacher of dress, uh, dance, ukulele, song, language uh, in the Hawaiian language. Wow. They all, they all learned that growing up. And my mother, when she picked up a ukulele, it was like a symphony. It was like going to the Bolshoi. It was, it was beautiful. The way she played the, the ukulele, her fingers dance like a Bolshoi. Uh, mm. It's just astonishing. When they were in Japan, you know how they, they went to a luau in Japan. Okay. You know? All right. And the, uh, you know how they pull, the Japanese were putting it on and they had Japanese doing the hula on the stage and they grabbed somebody in the audience. They grabbed my mother <laughs> and brought her on the stage and you know to just joke around and my mother started to do the hula. They faded away and the lights went dim and the lights only went on her and she danced the most gorgeous hula and they were in awe. The place was just astonished. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Wow. So, Michael, back then, the primary language in Hawaii was Hawaiian, yeah? Yes. And English was a second language. Yes. He, my grandfather said, you couldn't be here if you didn't know Hawaiian because wherever you went, they spoke Hawaiian. Wow. So all the stores, everyone, everyone you knew. The street speaking. signs were in Hawaiian. Right. Everything was the Hawaiian. The newspapers were in Hawaiian. Right. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. He's, and then, of course, the Hawaiian language almost died out. It did, but you know, I never knew that growing up. I learned that later. I always thought it continued to thrive because the way Gramps described growing up, speaking Hawaiian, everybody he knew spoke Hawaiian. My grandfather said when he was six years old, this is 1891, according to him, nobody was surfing. There were surfboards in the museum. They saw lithographs of Hawaiian surfing and they all knew about surfing, but it was a lost art. So he contributed a $20 gold piece for his brothers went and used that to buy a redwood board and the, and the materials to fashion a surfboard. And they went down with the surfboard to Waikiki and surfed in Waikiki for the first time in I don't know how long. So he always said, I finance the rebirth of surfing. <laughs> That's an amazing story. Yeah, it is. It is. And one of my treasures at home, I have, he, he collected stamps. So I have, I have hundreds of stamps, pre-provisional um, government, Hawaiian monarchy stamps, and then provisional government stamps that he, he collected all those years. And they're just wonderful to read through them. And, you know, with the pictures of the, of the Hawaiian monarchs on them and, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the history that's there that he collected his whole life. Mm. Michael, what, it's, what is it like for people when they begin to hear this history of your family and discover that you're a descendant of Hawaiian nationals? No, they, have, they have no comprehension, mm. no comprehension. Mm. It's like if you live in California, how many people go back to the days of the Spanish? Yeah. There's, it's not not many handful. So right, yeah. So it's a it's it's a unique thing, hmm. uh, but it's I think I think it's a noble and it's a important task to be able to pass on this lore and the history and not let it get lost in history or disappear. Yeah, and it also shows that there are 
Hawaiian Kingdom uh, nationals alive today. Yes, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Michael, what a wonderful message. You know what? That's where we got to leave it. Thank you so much, Mahalo, for being on Voices of Truth with us today. It's been awesome hearing your family's story, the history of your family, and the history of the Hawaiian Kingdom and everything back then. I know this is going to blow people out of the waters when they see this and hear this because very few people know this kind of history of Hawaii. Yeah. You know, it's just amazing. So thank you for being here and telling us about that. You're welcome. And mahalo to our viewers for joining Michael and me here at Oahu Cemetery and here now at the Royal Mausoleum, which we now today call Mauna Ala. Remember, you can watch us on the web 24-7 on VoicesOfTruthTV.com and you can like Voices of Truth one-on-one -on -one with Hawaii's Future on Facebook. I'm Ehu Kekahu Cardwell for the Kiwani Foundation along with Mike Lilly. And until next time, Ahoy ho! Mahalo for watching Voices of Truth one-on-one -on -one with Hawaii's future. Watch us on the web 24-7 at VoicesOfTruthTV.com. You'll find all our shows, including this one, in case you want to see it again or share it with family and friends. Also, view our weekly video commentaries at FreeHawaiiTV.com. And check out our blog, published daily, at FreeHawaii.info. It's all part of the Free Hawaii Broadcasting Network.